Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Daniela Sfer, uh, Regional Head of Corporate Relations for Career Services at London Business School in Dubai. Uh, on behalf of the Collar Institute of Private Equity and London Business School, I welcome you and thank you very much for coming to share with us this special evening. This event is, uh, is a prestigious one as we have as our guest, uh, Christopher Flowers. Um, Chris Flowers is uh, the CEO of JC Flowers and Company, an investment firm specializing in financial services. Thank you very much, and I'd like to add uh, my welcome also to Daniela's. Thank you very much for being here. Um, this actually represents the first time uh, the Collet Institute has hosted an event in Dubai, and uh, probably actually outside of London, so it's a, a first for us. So tonight, what we're going to be discussing is the global outlook for financial services. And it doesn't seem that a day goes past without another comment in the newspaper about financial services, whether it's the restructuring of the banks that we know, like UBS, Credit Suisse, and Barclays today, or further calls for regulation, tighter regulation, and broader regulation to encompass shadow banking. And I have to say that if we're going to be discussing this, I couldn't think of a better person to have as a speaker than Chris Flowers. If you will look at his CV, he's seen it, done it, been there. He's been at the table with the regulators in Japan, in Europe, and played key roles in the 2008 in the US and the financial crises there. Um, a word of background about our company, the perspective that we bring to financial services. Uh, our company, JC Flowers & Co., is one of the largest or maybe the largest private equity firm uh, in the financial services arena. All we do is financial services. We have about $9 billion of assets under management. We invest in banks. We invest in insurance companies. Uh, we invest in uh, the other segments of financial services, such as uh, the securities industry, credit cards, finance companies, and so forth. Um, and we also have investments in many parts of the world. So of course, in the United States, uh, but also in Europe, in Japan, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, Taiwan. Uh, we've been in a lot of different places. Uh, so that's, that's the general background and perspective and experience that we bring. Thank you. Now, before moving to look at the outlook, perhaps, um, you know, I don't want, we don't want to dwell on 2008, but I think um, they say that um, you know, going through pain is a great mechanism for learning. And I, I wondered if I could ask you, what do you think are the um, key takeaways that you have from um, living up to that time and through that time? Well, uh, uh, our industry and we ourselves took quite a beating in 2008. Um, and it was, of course, a very, very difficult uh, period for the financial services industry. And I think we have um, entered into a kind of a, not, not just a, a cyclical change, but a secular uh, development in, in, in our industry, uh, which is going to take some time to play out. Um, but the themes which are most important are, number one, um, increasing capital requirements across our industry, which is a capital-intensive industry to start with. Number two, uh, much more regulation, all kinds of new regulations, uh, much of which is contradictory or useless, but still lots of, lots of new regulations. Um, three, of course, a lackluster environment uh, economically. And also, very importantly, the fate of the euro and how what happens to the euro um, affects our industry are all big trends which are different than before 2008. In fact, um, you've, you've moved to London, which uh, must make at least the, uh, the UK government very happy to, uh, to give that kind of vote of confidence to the city. And also, you've, um, you have said on many occasions that um, you see Europe as providing many opportunities and uh, obviously quite a lot of challenges as well that many others would see. And maybe it's a good t chance now, a good time now, to talk a bit about the impact of, of those um, opportunities and challenges and the impact of the euro. Um, because obviously I know that uh, you've got very strong views and thoughts about that and how they, that might impact those particular opportunities you see. Uh, so let me make a few comments on that, if I may. And f first of all, um, one important force in our industry is Basel III, which is requiring banks to hold more capital. And as a result, 
one-way banks are trying to get there is by deleveraging and reducing their balance sheets. Um, also, um, in Europe, for many banks, there have been EU state aid uh, proceedings which are requiring banks to divest or to reduce their balance sheet as well. And there are also liquidity pressures on banks in the Eurozone. So for that reason, banks are also trying to bring down their balance sheet so they have less funding pressure. As a result, we see a lot of opportunities arising out of the European scene. Some of those are in Europe. A lot of them are not in Europe. Some of them are in the United States or in Asia. Um, but that's a really big theme in our business, the Eurozone deleveraging. And Obviously, that what we're seeing now is the banks are deleveraging from sort of loan to deposit rates of somewhere 150%. Um, where, do you, where do you think the um, push comes to continue to deliver? And do you think that some of the regulation or some of the um, uh, financing, say, from the ECB has is, is actually slowed that deleveraging down? Or, or, and how do you see it progressing? So this is a very important point from our perspective. In, in America, in Japan, the loan to deposit ratio is generally, in Britain too actually, is generally under 100%. So banks can basically fund themselves for the most part without resorting to the wholesale markets. It's been that way historically. That's not a new development. In the Eurozone, it's been different. It was different and banks had more loans than they had deposits. So they had to borrow money in the wholesale markets to make all that balance. Since the crisis has come to the Eurozone, a lot of that wholesale funding has gone away. And as you said, Ann, that's been replaced by the ECB to a significant degree. So now what you have is a situation where uh, banks are relying to a significant extent on the ECB. If the ECB wasn't there, things would be truly disastrous because there would be, for many banks, nowhere to turn. And it would lead to a major calamity, even as it is neither the ECB nor the borrowers are really comfortable having the ECB be a long-term source of permanent funding. And so therefore, there's a big pressure on Eurozone banks to bring the balance sheet down and to um, reduce ECB borrowings. And that's something which is really a Eurozone thing. It's not an American thing. It's not a Japanese thing. It's a Eurozone thing. And what, what, what do you think about this, um, the differences in the, in the regulators? Then you, you, you've seen it from your own um, negotiations in, in the US, and you've obviously seen it in, in the UK as well. Do you think that um, the ring fencing is going to um, create a future of um, deglobalization? Um, so that we will have more national champions, or how, how do you see that progressing? Those are big, big questions, and let me offer a few comments on that. One thing, one thing I, I think, uh, uh, which is not necessarily a common opinion, is that eventually, you mentioned 2020, you have to pick that as an example, that uh, financial institutions and returns on capital and profitability for financial institutions will return to normal. Not everybody thinks that. There are those who think that the financial institutions industry is uh, facing permanently lower returns on capital. I don't see it that way. I don't think that's going to happen. And the reason I don't think that's going to happen is because these industries are absolutely essential to the function of the economy. And it is absolutely essential that over time, more capital flow into these industries. Uh, so that they can provide the financing the economy needs. And to do that, returns have to improve. And the way that's going to happen, if you ask me, is that over time, um, customers are going to pay more. The mix of business is going to shift. Balance sheets are going to change. And we're going to end up in a place where you can earn an adequate return if you're a global financial institution. So I, I do think we'll end up with a smaller number, but still a significant number of global financial institutions. And that's good because we need that. There are obviously big companies, uh, big institutions around the world that need the kind of breadth, scale, et cetera, that big global uh, financial institutions providers provide. OK, so we are going to sort of see um, somewhat of a, um, a shift then. The first time, um, whereas corporates have to, and the business schools, you talk about strategy based on a limited amount of resources. But banks, so far, seem to have 
tried to dabble in all businesses, but now they're going to have to make some serious decisions about where to allocate their capital. That, I think, is very true. Uh, 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 more than any time in a long time, financial institutions have to make hard choices about what businesses they want to be in and what they can't be in and what they can't afford to be in. And I think there is a major realignment coming, a shift as various banks and other financial institutions shift and move. And I think this is a time, more than ever, where there's a premium on excellent management, excellent execution. I mean, that, of course, is always important. But in a time as tricky as this, you're going to have a broader dispersion of winners and losers where the, uh, the, the, the institutions that make the best choices or the best managed are really there's going to be a big differentiation between that um, and the ones with the poorest, the poorest performance. And part of that, of course, is the cards they start out with. Not every institution has the same hand of cards. But it's also a lot about making the right choices from here. Maybe we should kind of just turn slightly now to private equity involvement because, um, and ask perhaps what might seem to be a naive question, first of all, is does private equity have a role to play in financial uh, services? I can start with just a very <laughs> broad-based question. You're there. Right. But, but it's, is it a different proposition from uh, private equity in corporate businesses? I think it is a little bit different. And of course, you asked me, do I think private equity has a role in financial institutions? That's all we do all day long for 14 years. So of course, I think the answer to that is yes, as you would expect me to think. Um, and in a strange kind of way, I wish fewer people agreed with me, because then we would have less competition, which would make me very happy. Um, we do have competition, however. And um, uh, um, there, there, there is really, I think, a useful role for private equity and financial, and financial institutions investing. Um, I, I do think it's different than what you might call normal or more standard private equity. One reason because of the, it's very highly regulated, obviously, and more so than ever. The regulatory complexity has increased geometrically or exponentially in the time that I've been involved in this, and it is extraordinarily complex. That's one thing that's very different. Another thing that's quite different is and our, our, our transactions are not usually leveraged. So borrowing money and all that is not usually a big part of what we do, which is different. And that's, of course, because the companies we invest in are already leveraged. They already have a big balance sheet. And so it's usually either difficult, impossible, or imprudent to borrow any more money. <clears throat> so that's also quite different. But um, when you get through all of that, there are definitely parts of the financial institutions industry where private equity plays an important role, where it brings organized capital to companies and investors that need it, where the public markets don't work, where other financial institutions don't work, where, where we play a useful role. Uh, in terms of you talked about some of the challenges, you know, with the dealing with the regulators, and perhaps I'm not sure how much you want to say about that, but um, um, is it a, is it a um, once, you've, once you've got a track record of dealing with a regulator, once you get your first license, is it easier to get your, a, a license in a different country? Does, does that help? Well, let me say a word or two about the whole regulatory landscape. <clears throat> One is that, of course, the, the, not of course, but let me say the politics are broadly similar um, in most countries. And banks and financial institutions are not very popular in most countries. And that has been a big factor in regulation. That's kind of true in terms of background everywhere. However, how that actually plays out on the ground um, is, is, is often quite different by country. And one of the problems in America today, for example, is that there are so many overlapping regulators competing with each other that it leads to a much more burdensome environment than, for example, you find in other countries such as Japan, Britain, Germany, that all have a single, a single regulator. So um, uh, that, that's, that's, that's one factor. I do think that for private equity, um, managing the regulations and the regulators are very, very important. And regulators do look at your track record in their own country. They also look at your track record in other countries. They look at your experience, and, and that's 
become more pronounced since the crisis. So to show up in country X, Y, Z and say I'd like to buy a bank is just, is just not on. It's just not on. You have to have uh, more than that to be convincing these days. Okay. And then besides, in addition to, uh, to that, um, obviously we, we talked about before how the uh, many banks are being um, well, still very much dependent on the ECB for their funding. So to what extent, when you know, as, as, as you show up, can you get access to that kind of um, <coughs> same funding? Uh, and to what extent are you, are you at a disadvantage in terms of costs? And how, how, do, you, how do you go about that? Well, uh, we're not at any technical disadvantage in the sense that when we talk about the ECB, we're talking about the Eurozone. And if we own a bank in the Eurozone, or if it's publicly traded, or if it's a mutual, or whatever, the ECB rules are pretty much the same. I would say, so not at a disadvantage in that sense. What I would say, though, what's happened in Europe very markedly is it's gone to a national, not a Europe-wide basis. And so the rules in the Netherlands, and the rules in Germany, and the rules in Spain, and the rules in Portugal are not the same, even though they're supposed to be. So there's a real sort of nationalism at work there. That's really where the playing field, if you will, stops being level. That much more than who owns the institutions, what country it's in. Okay. And in terms of getting access to these assets, do you, do you think more assets are, become, are going to become available now? Or do you think that because of, because of this nationalism, so to speak, if, there is, if, it, if it exists, um, it, is, it is difficult to get hold of some of the assets that you, you would like to? Or is that beginning to change? Uh, I, a couple points on that. One thing, one question is what volume of opportunities are going to be available for sale, if you will, in the next couple of years? And at least as far as Europe is concerned, there's sort of a spectrum where, on the one hand, if, um, if European banks were lavishly recapitalized, similar to the TARP program in America, something like that, and that took all the pressure off, you're at one end of the spectrum and maybe not much happens. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, banks that are deleveraging only sell what they can afford to sell. If you deleverage by taking a huge loss, you didn't actually deleverage. You, you may, you, you re so they can't take afford, afford huge losses. So there are a lot of variables which are going to uh, um, affect how much becomes available. But having said that, there's clearly a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to bring balance sheets down, which would suggest that there'll be a lot of opportunities. And, and in terms of you know, our opportunities to invest them as private equity firms, not everything is suitable for private equity, but a lot of it is. You know, so for example, when it comes to buying banks, uh, private equity, in my experience, cannot compete with other big banks. So big bank A wants to buy bank B. We're not going to be competitive buying bank B. Our opportunities have always come where bank B doesn't have anybody, there's no natural banking buyer, there, there is no natural banking buyer, it's an orphan, if you will, then we have an opportunity. Then things become interesting. And, and you talked a bit about before about good management being absolutely critical, and in general, private equity, they often go in and change the management. Is that something that you do, or do you, do you tend to work with, do you start from the beginning, do you put your own people in now? Well, it, it, it varies, but often we do either right at the beginning. One scenario is right at the beginning. For example, um, in 2009, we bought a bank from the FDIC called NDMAC out in California. It changed its name to One West Bank, put everything new right from the beginning. The bank had gone broke. It was a complete you know, wreck, and we changed everything. So that's one scenario, and, and I think a scenario where we bring something to the party. Um, then there's a scenario which <laughs> is not as fun, where uh, there's trouble, and as a result of trouble, we need to make changes, and there was, there was a lot of that in 2008. And I think this is another thing which private equity can successfully argue with the regulators, <clears throat> which is that when there is trouble, sometimes things got changed and decisive action took place faster, yeah. where there was a shareholder paying attention. So I think that's, that that's the, uh, one of the skills of private equity, again, the sort of speed of execution. And often that's difficult to do, though, when, the regulate, when it's in a regulated industry. But uh, you have 
found that you've been able to do that? <clears throat> Speed is a relative thing. Um, uh, we are faster maybe than some others in the financial institutions, but it's a lot slower than what's going on in Palo Alto, California. <clears throat> so so let's, um, let, let's, look to, um, let's look to 2020. Let's, um, with our crystal balls, and obviously it's, uh, I'm not asking you to make any sort of predictions, but maybe <laughs> if we have a, a look at of, of the range of outcomes, um, and look to see what kind of players, there. at the moment there are what, 27 global CIFIs at the moment, do we think there'll be 27 in 2020? Do, who do, who, or what kind of organizations do we think will, will be there? And what are these real risks um, to your view of um, better returns coming to the industry? Well, I'm, uh, as I said before, I, I uh, am quite sure that over time, eventually, returns will get back to normal, i.e. above the cost of capital, because they have to. Um, however, uh, the path to get there, um, I think, is not so clear. Uh, the, the one thing about financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, they really are reflections of the economies in which they operate. It is very difficult for a bank to be completely divorced from what's going on in the country in which it operates. And so therefore, the path to the future for financial institutions is in a lot of ways the path that the economy takes. So um, we have an economy now, as everybody here knows, with a lot of uncertainty in it and many parts of it. And if I knew how that was going to turn out, I'd know a lot better um, how from the financial institutions returns are going to be and what kind of structure we might have at the end of it. I will say one or two things, though. One is I do think we're going to have a bigger dispersion than usual over the next 10 years. I do, because there's just so much change, so much both random and not random activity going on that it's, that it's just is going to be a big variation. Um, and for the winners who come out with a smaller oligopoly at the end of it, you know, a, a very profitable future potentially. Another thing I will say is that what happens to the, the euro itself is an unusual issue. I've been through many ups and downs in the economy with cyclical booms and busts, et cetera, but they have this issue of whether the currency is going to persist or not is a very unusual issue. If, if a country in the euro defaults or leaves the euro, the banks are all going broke. That's what happens. And that, A, will be calamitous. Um, and B, you know, makes you think about where you want to invest. So I guess my point about it is this, the whole euro issue is an important issue. We think it's likely, highly likely, the euro will hold together. But if it doesn't, it's really going to be a disaster. And you know, it's not a zero chance that happens. There's a chance that happens. Well, one, uh, perhaps before we just open up to questions, one final thing. What about new entrants? What about um, um, the emergence of the large um, banking organizations in, in the Far East? Um, do we think that they will emerge um, to play a more dominant uh, role than they do currently beyond their national boundaries? Probably, I would guess that the the successful the, the successful, well managed so, some from the Far East, from China, Japan, etc., that are successful in, uh, in in execution and management will be successful in building broader global businesses and will be important globally. Here's I, I, I would offer this comment. I think one of the keys to that, which is not so easy to do, is. Uh, to be multi, to be multicultural. I think that's really important. I think to be successful, if you're a Chinese bank or a Japanese bank or pick whatever country you want, American bank, you can't show up at some distant part of the world and just run it all. Uh, it has to be a place where it sort of loses some of its home identity and becomes more global in its, in its in it, because otherwise, no amount of money, you know, is going to make it work. Thank you very much. Thank you.